best thing I can do is give this person some sort of context and they'll tell us why the crime was committed, yeah. i.e. motive. I think the chemistry is telling us that this person is playing a very careful political and religious game. And you think there's all this political upheaval going on in ancient Egypt and it's encapsulated in a, a tiny sample the size of a pinhead. Just because they're 3,000 years old doesn't mean that we can't apply modern forensics and come up with good answers. I'm far from convinced that's going to be an easy job. It feels like it's doing more damage, if, if you see what I mean. This is a really exciting find and a brilliant result for this sort of experimental archaeology. In Bolton Museum in the north of England lies a unique mummy, partially unwrapped, yet spectacularly preserved after three millennia. Her identity shrouded in mystery, her cause of death lost to history. This is a, a great mummy, fantastic mm. preservation. The uh, coffin and mummy are probably our two most popular pieces in the Egyptian gallery. And you can, and see, you can why. see why. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a beautiful coffin. Uh, a number of people have studied it in great detail. We know it's a very fine example of its period. We know who it was made for and what the owner was. Yeah, there's a lovely image there of the, the person it was made for, obviously a lady of very high mm. status in her fine linen robes and, and lovely wig. Yep, and you can see just she's uh, making an offering to a deity, and then here on a panel of inscription, you've got her, her name and title. She's the Lady of the House, the Chantress of Amun Re, King of the Gods, and here's her name, To Henut. So we know who she was and what she did. One thing I have noticed, it does seem to be an incredibly tight fit um, for the, the person mm. within. So I'd be a little concerned that when this was actually completely wrapped, I can't see how this person would have fitted inside this coffin. You can really see where the shoulders are brushing against the sides of the coffin. The mummy, as you say, would have been a good deal fatter when it was intact. There's definitely something suspicious here. Uh, we need to get the mummy out so we can have a, a good look. Dr. Joanne Fletcher's mission is to take this misfit mummy, bring it to life, and then find out how that life came to its end. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Delve into the history of the ancients with History Hit's exclusive offering of documentaries. Explore with us the enchanting temple of Karnak, or take a deep dive into the fascinating prehistory of Scotland. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. She is one of Britain's foremost Egyptologists and a world authority on mummies. The grime of centuries could hide any number of secrets from a casual observer, but Joanne is anything but casual. Beautifully preserved earlobe, absolutely superb. And the teeth, the, the teeth are really quite extraordinary because although there's some chipping there, what you're actually seeing very distinctly here is, a, is an overjet of the upper set of teeth, which is a, a very unusual feature. The initial physical inspection is crucial. In her work, the tiniest details often provide the vital clue as to how someone lived or died. Together with her team of elite scientists, Dr. Fletcher has investigated mummies on almost every continent. This is going to be a tough case for the mummy investigation team. Dr. Stephen Buckley is one of the world's top archaeological chemists. He uses cutting-edge techniques from the world of chemical research to identify substances in, on and around mummies. 
Duncan Lees is a forensic archaeologist specializing in high-tech survey techniques. His forensic expertise means he's called in to investigate modern crime scenes all over the world. Jill Scott is an Egyptologist and an expert in the preservation and conservation of mummies. Her research skills and wealth of archaeological knowledge make her perfect as the team's archive and background researcher for the investigation. The challenge is now on. The team may have the tools of modern forensics, but with little information to go on, they'll need all their investigative skills to unlock this ancient mystery. Dr. Fletcher's briefing gives the team a starting point for the investigation. The coffin apparently has been studied by quite a lot of academics over the years. They know plenty uh, about the, the woman it was made for. You can see it's, it's beautiful colours. Uh, this is the lady herself. She was a priestess. So you can imagine this in its complete state. There is no way that body would have fitted originally into this coffin. It seems, it seems to fit into me. I mean, it's, it's, it's in there. Yeah, but you can see it here. I mean, where the body's gone into the coffin, particularly around the shoulder region, it's taken off paint down the side of the coffin where it's been squeezed in. Egyptian mummies were generally very well wrapped. We've got documented evidence of, you know, up to 250 square metres of linen wrappings being used on these individuals. The mummy's size is a clear sign that something's not right, but the team is going to need more to go on to have a chance of cracking the case. There's a distinct facial feature there of uh, overjet. A what? It's almost like book teeth. All oh, right. Um, in right. which you have the upper set of teeth protruding very much over the bottom set. Now, this is potentially quite an intriguing find because we know from the evidence that's already been collected that the royals, the royal mummies, the pharaohs of the New Kingdom, also shared this distinct characteristic. For the ancient Egyptians, everything connected with death was significant. If the team's going to find out who she was and how she died, they can't afford to leave any stone unturned. One tiny mark on the mummy's face could be the key to the story. I think for me it's the, um, the pock marking on the skin, uh, whether this is um, embalming to do with the mummification or, or whether it's something else. Or just bad skin. Mm. Well, hasn't it been suggested that the mummy of Ramses V had smallpox because he's got these pustules on his face? That's true, but the science wasn't particularly convincing. The next step in the investigation will be critical. The 3,000-year-old mummy is priceless and incredibly delicate. If the team put a foot wrong while they're gathering evidence, they could destroy the very clues they're looking for. Any human contact could contaminate the chemical evidence, so Stephen Buckley takes his samples first. Every substance has its unique chemical fingerprint. Stephen's analysis of embalming materials can yield clues about ancient trade routes, religious strife, and even the politics of ancient Egypt. The combinations of ingredients used for embalming vary enormously over the thousands of years of Egyptian history, and identifying the chemical mix in a particular case can help pinpoint a date. If Stephen can identify the individual chemicals present in these samples, the specific combinations could have a symbolic significance that will tell us about the mummy's life and death. The chemical analysis will take days, if not weeks, to process. The next move is down to Dr. Fletcher. She calls in some specialist help to examine the pictograms that cover the side of the coffin. Could hieroglyphics expert Alan Files reveal vital information for the team? So, Alan, what do you make of these particular hieroglyphs? Mm, 21st Dynasty. Yeah. You can tell by the yellow and the, the orange. Um, we have Nebet Per, again, lady, lady of, of the house, a chantress of Amun Ra. So she's who's got... sung before the gods and played yeah. instruments for the gods in the temple. A very high status Presumably lady. Presumably at Karnak, quite Absolutely. possibly. Absolutely. Karnak temple, yeah. she'd be sort of a regular performer before Absolutely. the gods. There's an interesting story here, yeah. isn't there? 
nearly every detail of the mummy's life is apparently recorded on the coffin. She was a singer, probably at one of Egypt's greatest temples, Karnak, participating in rituals with a sacred rattle called a sistrum. It's a great start for the investigation. Well, we've certainly got plenty of yeah, clues to go absolutely. on. All the elements are there, we've just got to put them together and, and try and make sense and of it all. Another mystery upon us, but a lovely piece of work. The title written on the coffin, Chantress of Amun, was just as much a badge of social prominence as a job description. Chantresses would be high-class women who would spend one month in three assisting at temple ceremonies. In ancient Egypt, the temples were highly restricted, and jobs that provided access to them were reserved for the elite of Egyptian society. The hieroglyphs have given Joanne a wealth of information about the mummy, but shed no light on the cause of death. In search of a breakthrough, Joanne has brought in some heavyweight help. Paleopathologist Professor Don Brothwell has an international reputation that extends far beyond the world of archaeology. His investigations of everything from mass murders to Danish bog bodies have made him a world authority. With the help of a full-body X-ray scan, Don will be able to see beneath the mummy's ancient skin and the wrappings that cover her lower body to identify any injuries that could relate to her cause of death. And here, the bottom of the spine is seen. And there seems to be some material inside the abdomen here, doesn't there? what exactly might be revealed later on. The upper teeth are very um, projected uh, in front of the lower teeth, so you have a rather sort of prominent upper teeth in the jaw. And the wear on the teeth suggests to me that's not particularly marked. The fact that Don's dental inspection has revealed very little wear on the teeth means the mummy must have enjoyed a high-status diet of soft food and been less than 30 years old at the time of her death. This young woman was struck down in the prime of her life. We have something at the back of the skull which looks as if we have a deposit at the back, either uh, something pushed into the skull through the nasal area, through the nose. Right, can we move on to the thigh? Not a particularly large head of the femur, which isn't a very masculine um, feature, but combined with the pelvic detail, I would say this is a fairly slenderly built male. This bombshell, that the mummy is actually male, means the team will have to rethink all their assumptions. Steve, interesting results. We've done these digital x-rays. Sure. And um, what we find in the skull and in the pelvis is very definite evidence that this is a male, ah. not, not female. Right. There's enough information from the, the detail of the skull, things like the frontal sinuses and yep. parts of the pelvis which indicates you know, the sex of the individual. I'm absolutely sure this is male. Right. So, so an interesting puzzle. Don's search for the mummy's cause of death has totally transformed its identity. The fact that it's male, not female, helps explain why it doesn't fit in the coffin. But if this isn't the coffin's original occupant, all of the information from the casket's inscriptions is irrelevant. The investigation is almost back to square one. The team needs a fresh start. Egyptologist Jill Scott wants to find out if modern dental medicine can tell us anything about the mummy. So she tracks down orthodontic consultant Jay Kindelan. Well, the mummy demonstrates a combination of both prominence of the upper front teeth uh, and also an element of what we would call mandibular retrusion. So the lower jaw is actually set back right. in relation to the rest of the face. The unusual combination of these two facial deformities would have made life difficult. I think the main issue would have been one of uh, eating food. Um, the mummy may not have been able to bite into an apple normally, or if they had sandwiches in Egyptian times, uh, they may not have been able to bite a sandwich properly. Um, the mummy probably would have had to chop up the food to put in separately. 
And what about speaking? Absolutely. I mean, there are many sounds, including plosive sounds, where you would put your lips together to make the necessary noise. Um, our mummy really wouldn't have been able to function in that way, uh, and lisping would have been a real problem. A picture is emerging of an individual beset by problems. A young man with trouble eating, speaking, everyday things that we take for granted. But while his distinctive teeth were troublesome, could his condition also be a sign that he wasn't as unlucky as he's beginning to appear? A family album of ancient Egyptian pharaohs hints at a possible royal connection. And there is the supposition here that these people were all related. So it tends to run in families, so the mummy's parents probably would have had a similar facial profile, um, and it would pass down from one generation to the next. We have patients referred to maybe 11, 12, 13 years of age, and, and often as their parents walk through the door with the patients, you can see really how the children are going to turn out in later life. Right, without, without treatment, obviously. Absolutely. I mean, it is very possible that uh, the mummy and these other individuals have come from the same genetic stock, if you like. Uh, but those features alone wouldn't really point you to the fact they were definitely related. Uh, what you really need to do is get into something like three-dimensional facial reconstruction so you can see what the face is like in all planes of space. The dental evidence suggests the mummy could be related to royalty, but it's going to take facial reconstruction and further investigations to confirm that. A picture of the mummy is building up, but the team's no closer to discovering how he died. Joanne calls a meeting. With his textbook knowledge of ancient diseases, Professor Don Brothwell could help pin down the mummy's cause of death. What do you think about this sort of marking on the face. It's quite a sort of suspicious looking thing, isn't it? I mean, it does look like a rash, doesn't it? Well, that's interesting because quite a few Egyptologists, when they see these features on mummies, have sort of raised the question, is it smallpox? Is it evidence for some sort of, sort of killer disease? Smallpox was a massive killer in the ancient world, responsible for millions of deaths worldwide. Victims of smallpox are covered with pustules that break off to leave ugly scarring, resembling the marks on the mummy's face. With no known cure, a diagnosis of smallpox was a death sentence until the disease was almost eradicated by vaccination in the last hundred years. Don's vast knowledge of human remains enables him to make a quick judgment. My guess is it's post-mortem. It extends on to only regions of the of the body. Uh, and I've seen the same kind of thing in uh, uh, bog bodies, for instance. And, and again, I think it's post-mortem. The most likely explanation for the marks on the mummy's face is drying out of the skin during the embalming process. With the killer disease eliminated as a cause of death, the team turns to in-depth analysis of the X-ray results for answers. The brain box is obviously empty except for what looks like a deposit at the back of the head. And all those little fragments there due to the damage when the point, whatever metal implement it was, was driven in. I think that explains this sort of area of, yeah. is it bone, is it loose bone? Because I was interested in cross-referencing with the sort of x-rays of Tutankhamun, the yes. most famous ancient Egyptian of them all. Yes. But you also have what appears to be a kind of bone fragment which for for many years was regarded as a cause of death you know this bash on the head was King Tut murdered and all that yeah. so I'm interested on in your thoughts on that little tiny oh. fragment there bone fragments in the brain cavity could be evidence of foul play are they signs of a blow to the head like the one thought by many to have killed King Tutankhamun or are they just a byproduct of the mummification process so, Adam, do you think to try and work out exactly what's going on on this X-ray image, we ought to undertake some form of experiment? Yeah, I think it'd be well worthwhile, um, as long as you don't call me in. A lot of force characters. is going to be needed, isn't it? It is, yes. Uh, so... Duncan? Can we just have a word I'm about this? I'm not entirely happy with the way this is going, judging by the conversation we've been having. Well, I think on. we need somebody with a, a fair amount of, of strength on this one. 
It's trying to recreate what we're seeing on the x-ray here. We know that the brain was removed by some sort of force up through the nose with a metal tool and then the brain was taken out. So what we're trying to do is recreate the sort of damage that you're getting within the, the human skull in an experimental way. Well, let's wait and see what happens because I'm far from convinced that's going to be an easy job for you. If the experiment can produce chips of bone in the skull, it could be a major step in the investigation. But replicating a 3,000-year-old brain removal process will be easier said than done. The removal of the brain was just one stage of mummification. For an ancient Egyptian, the preservation of their body after death was the key to eternal life. So tremendous importance was attached to every aspect of the embalming process. To prevent decay, the main internal organs, other than the heart and kidneys, were removed and stored separately. Removing the organs without damaging the rest of the body required tremendous skill on the part of the embalmers. With the experiment underway to try to explain the bone fragments inside the skull, the investigation is making headway. And at the team's state-of-the-art chemical laboratory, Stephen Buckley could be one step closer to finding the mummy's identity. After hours of careful preparation, the first results from Stephen's chemical analysis are starting to come through. GCMS is the gold standard when it comes to identifying organic chemicals. It provides a graphic fingerprint of every chemical compound within a minute sample. That can mean hundreds of substances in a sample the size of a pinhead. What GCMS allows us to do is to identify components individually from a very complex mixture. There's plenty of components in there, so hopefully some of them will be uh, quite interesting. From what we know so far, certain substances were associated with particular with, with certain deities. So there's certainly symbolism, certainly symbolism as well as the practical. Uh, materials, there's no question of that. I suppose we're really looking for the more minor components that may tell us something about political identity, religious affiliations, trade routes, that sort of thing. The GCMS machine heats the tiny samples until they turn into gas. The temperature at which substances in the samples vaporize plays a key part in identifying them. Hours later, he has his first breakthrough. This is a major component in the sample, uh, thymol. There's actually a lot of it in time, for example. What it certainly points out already um, to me is um, that the embalmers knew their stuff, that they were choosing materials that would have genuinely have preservative properties, antibacterials. So thymol is, is quite a powerful antibacterial. Identifying 3,000-year-old plant residues would be impressive enough, but not for Stephen Buckley. He can even tell you what altitude they grew at. What we certainly have is a conifer resin. What I'm trying to look for now are markers that suggest um, a mountain, a mountain conifer. If conifers are exposed to uh, higher levels of radiation as they are at higher altitude, then they actually give um, a chemical fingerprint showing that, and that, that can sometimes give us clues. The cocktail of expensive embalming ingredients containing a resin from a distant mountain conifer confirms the team's thoughts that the mummy must have been someone very important. It also hints at exactly who this mummy may have been, but that can only emerge after days of painstaking analysis. While Stephen's making progress on the mummy's identity on his own, Joanne's going to need some help to carry out her experiment on the cause of the mummy's skull damage. The fundamentals of metalworking haven't changed for thousands of years. Don Barker is still practicing skills that would be familiar to any ancient medical toolmaker. Egyptian embalming tools were originally made in copper, a soft metal easily bent into shape, but almost as easily broken. Copper was eventually replaced by stronger metals, so they're using authentic ancient designs to make tools in both copper and iron to see if either can produce the kind of bone chips seen in the mummy. Wow, that's amazing. You can really get a feel for how they might have done it now, you know. 
For the whisking process to liquefy the brain for removal, Joanne has another tool made, a long, thin wire that will curve around the inside of the skull. So, yeah, you can see how you could feed it yeah. up the nose. Yeah. And then once it's up, then it's like a handle to rotate, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> With the replica ancient Egyptian tools complete, everything is set for a hands-on, practical experiment which could determine whether these kinds of implements could have been the cause of the mummy's skull damage. Following the revelation that our mummy is male, Duncan meets facial reconstruction specialist Stephanie Davy Jow to build a picture of what he may actually have looked like. So I have a virtual model of the skull here. OK. And what I then do is an analysis of the skull to determine um, sex, uh, approximate age, mm -hmm. as well as ethnic affiliation, if I can determine that. Right. With these parameters in place, Stephanie uses data gathered from modern populations to make an estimate of skin depth that she then applies to the model. I can add eyes. Um, every person has approximately the same size of eyes, but the placement inside of the eye socket or the orbital um, is dependent upon the individual. One thing that was interesting that I noticed when reconstructing this individual was the marked asymmetry in his orbitals. His eyes aren't even. Like the deformed jaw, the asymmetric eyes are another characteristic of some 18th and 19th dynasty Egyptian royalty. As the pieces come together, the mummy's looks seem to become more and more extraordinary. And you'll notice too in the profile, you can see he's got quite a receding chin, mm -hmm. um, coupled with the overjet, and he's got a, a convex nose. So he's got kind of a beaky nose and a receding chin. You're not and building up a very good picture <laughs> of what this guy's going to look like. I build it as I distinctive. see it. <laughs> yes. Distinctive, but yeah, can't hide from the facts. As the dental evidence suggests, the mummy was a young man with a whole host of problems. And next, I can begin to build the, the overlying skin surface mm -hmm. using the information from the tissue depths and the muscles and the shape of the skull. And you can begin to see what he looked like. That's oh, incredible, isn't it? He's certainly, um, choose my words carefully, distinctive, isn't he? He is, yes. I don't think he'd make any modern magazine covers. No. But... With a forensically accurate picture of the mummy, the investigation gains new impetus. The team are no longer dealing with desiccated remains, but a human being whose cause of death remains unknown. Duncan and Joanne are poised to conduct the experiment that should help decide whether the mummy was killed by a blow to the head or whether the bone chips in the skull are the product of embalming. With human volunteers in short supply, the team have to compromise. In our case, uh, we have to use a sheep's head, but in many ways, the sheep and the human, in terms of size, the size yeah, well, of the brain, etc., they are similar. quite similar, aren't they? The ancient Egyptians believed the heart was the centre for thought and emotion, so they were unsentimental about removing the brain to stave off the decomposition process. But with this, the idea was that it was forced up inside the nose, broke the top of the uh, nasal bone, and then the brain inside kind of whisked, uh, liquefied in effect, uh, and then it could be drained out back down the nose. So, time for a tap. Easy. Just a few minutes into the experiment, the team suffer a setback. Now look, it's bending. And that's exactly what the blacksmith said would happen. If we mark how far it's gone up, that must have gone through into the cavity, and it's bent around. With the copper tool out of action, Duncan is going to have to use a more modern iron version to stand any chance of recreating the damage in the mummy's skull. Much, much tougher and, uh, and hasn't bent around the skull cavity, but has definitely gone through it. In fact, I'm probably not going to be able to take this out again now. Hence the damage hey, to the... Oh. Now look. Oh, now that's in. lovely. Look at that. And it, these are fantastic because this is exactly... I wouldn't be able to extract all of these with the hook. I don't think I could pull all of the brain out. Chunks of brain tissue are a good start, but bone fragments remain elusive. 
Egyptian embalmers could remove a brain by liquidizing it in as little as 20 minutes. If Duncan can't produce bone chips in this time with the more destructive iron tool, the test must be considered a failure. So the 20 minutes is up, Duncan, so uh, how's it going? Look, I can't actually quite believe I'm saying this, but it's been incredibly interesting. I mean, what I've been able to do is extract actually quite a lot of the brain tissue here using um, both this, the smaller and thinner whippier action, but also with the heavy duty tool as well. Um, material has been coming out, but what's interesting me most of all is that within this material, there are chips of bone, really very clear shards of bone. That's exactly what we were seeing on the x-rays of the Bolton mummy. I'll just take the skull and tip it up here and see whether we get anything coming out through the nasal cavity. I have spent a long, you know, it's a good 20 minutes and violently moving the instruments around, but what we get is a big fat zero, absolutely nothing. The brain may not have completely liquidized in 20 minutes, but the experiment is still a major boost for the investigation. The brain removal process has produced visible chips of bone. With the embalming procedure itself clearly capable of causing this damage, there's just no reason to suppose that our mummy was hit on the head. It must be ruled out of the investigation. With one cause of death eliminated, the team are making real progress. Now, some hard work in the lab is uncovering exciting developments in the quest for the mummy's identity. Remnants of cloth from the mummy's wrappings contain telltale evidence. Certainly one of the things that struck me particularly when I was looking at the actual mummy in Bolton, the very sort of fine quality of this linen, because quite a lot of mummies, Egyptian mummies certainly, are wrapped in quite often quite coarse material, often reused, recycled, even amongst sort of what you call the middle classes, I guess. But with this one, it's, it's really fine stuff, you know, the finest yeah, quality. Definitely. And it's almost as if the linen's been applied, a little bit like papier-mâché, it's been applied in a thin layer and then coated in something, and then another layer of wrapping applied and another layer of coating. So I'd really be interested to see if the coating's applied on each layer, and certainly at different areas of the body. There's, there's plenty to sort of go on here, isn't there? There's a, a lot of interesting things at play, I think. Joanne's examination of the fabric confirms the team's first instincts that the mummy is someone very high class. But the results of Steve's chemical analysis promise dramatic new developments. The chemistry is looking, is actually looking quite interesting. We've got a lot of thymol, um, which is something that occurs in, in time, for example. What we've also got with this triterpenoid resin is uh, pistachio. Well, that's a very distinctive it's, chemical fingerprint, all those ingredients put together. To some extent, it's a royal marker. So I think it suggests this was, was someone of note, um, given the, the amount that's being used. The pistachio shrub, prized for its sweet-smelling resin, was used almost exclusively for embalming members of Egyptian royalty during the era of the New Kingdom. Suddenly, the notion that our mummy is of royal descent has gone from an intriguing idea to a definite possibility. But Stephen has even more surprises up his sleeve. What's also in interesting, curious initially, was the fact we actually have a, a, a division. Uh, so a line is being drawn through the mummy, if you like. The left side suggests sheep, possibly goat. With the right side, he's got cow or bull. One half of the mummy's upper body was covered in sheep fat, the other in cow fat, each substance symbolically linked to rival Egyptian gods. Sheep or goat, sort of the sacred ram of a moon, represented the sort of grand traditions of, of the ancient Egyptians. But then he's sort of playing both sides, isn't he? If he's sort of exactly showing exactly evidence of, 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 of the playing sort of cow sides. fat, a sort of bovine material, yeah. he's got this link to the Hathor, the yeah. bovine goddess, linked to the sun. It's an incredible discovery. By analysing tiny drops of fat taken from both sides of the body, Stephen Buckley has opened up a dramatic chapter of Egyptian history. Egypt in 1250 BC was politically divided between north and south. Hathor the cow was daughter of the ancient sun god Ra, a symbol of the north, favoured by priests who were loyal to the pharaoh. The god Amun, represented by a ram, was the chief deity of the powerful priests who dominated the south. 
I think the chemistry is telling us that this person is, is playing a very careful uh, political and religious game. Um, he wants to get the balance right. He's actually um, showing that he's pro-moon and um, pro-ra. When you think there's all this political upheaval going on in ancient Egypt and it's encapsulated in a, a tiny sample the size of a pinhead. If the mummy was performing this delicate political and religious balancing act in death, it narrows down the possibilities of who they were in life. So on the basis of this amazing data, are we able to sort of try and pinpoint more precisely who this, this person may or may not be? I, th I think for me, from, from the chemistry and the mummification evidence that we have, it suggests a possible Ramesses II connection. With the shaven head, that's an interesting one because, of course, it's a clear mark of a priest. In isolation, the mummy's lack of hair wouldn't be significant, but combined with all the other evidence of his status, his distinctive facial features and the religious importance of his embalming materials, it's a key indicator of his identity then potentially we're looking at one of the royal sons of one of the pharaohs. The chemistry suggests this mummy was rich and important, a prince of the royal house, a priest and a political player in one of the most turbulent periods in Egyptian history. The incredible 66-year reign of Ramesses II was an exciting time to be alive in ancient Egypt. Led by its extravagant king, the Egyptian empire expanded dramatically before slowly tumbling into economic decline. Ramesses was responsible for building some of the most spectacular monuments in ancient Egypt, many of which survive today. The temple complexes at Karnak and the Ramesseum forever pay silent tribute to an era of great achievements and great political intrigue. The teeth, the eyes, the chemistry and the shaven head all point to one identity. Of the hundreds of children that Ramesses II fathered, many would be sent into the priesthood, where they could enjoy some of the most powerful and privileged positions in Egyptian society. From within their magnificent temples, the priesthood could exert control over every aspect of Egyptian life. The team are managing to put together an extraordinary picture of who this mummy was in life, but they're no closer to knowing how he died. For an answer to this vital question, they'll need some high-tech assistance. A CAT scan, computer-assisted tomography, uses a series of X-rays to build a 3D image of the body. Hundreds of images taken from 360 degrees around the body are combined to build the picture. With this state-of-the-art imaging device, paleopathologist Don Brothwell can find traces of injury or illness in the ancient mummy that would elude a normal X-ray. What we're hoping to find here is any evidence of abnormality. So we ought really to look particularly yeah. to see whether we can find any incision. If they find an oblique embalming incision, it'll place the mummy in Egypt's 18th dynasty and everything the team has discovered would be thrown into question again. If the incision is vertical, the mummy would be tied to the 19th dynasty, the time of Ramesses II. Is that a cut? In that area, I'm just trying to compare it to the other side. During embalming, the organs would be removed through a single cut in the abdomen. After mummification, it would generally be tightly stitched, making the incision very thin and hard to find. Uh, it's the left-hand side where we should be finding the incision, right? Now remember, it's, it will be stitched up. The so skill of the Egyptian embalmers makes it a difficult search, but eventually they find it. It's a vertical incision. The discovery of the incision puts the mummy squarely in the time of Ramesses II, but further investigation will be needed to identify how the mummy died. But obviously, if we really are going to try and find the cause of death, we need to work over every image very carefully. Back in York, detailed analysis of the CT scans has uncovered a surprise hidden beneath the mummy's wrappings. Aha. This is a man. 
So we're coming down now into the pelvis. Can you see we're beginning to get a separate structure showing up there beyond the abdomen? And I'm fairly sure we're seeing sections of the penis there. So it's men, all right? That looks very, very sort of dense. No. <laughs> it looks like it's been quite well wrapped. Well, it's been uh, well prepared for death and the next life, I suppose. For sure. But what puzzles me is I can't see any evidence of a scrotum or testicles. The embalmers have taken great care to leave the mummy well prepared for the afterlife, but their preparations have left us with a puzzle. We're dealing with a sort of section through the arm about here. Look how tight the skin is. Again, yeah. we seem to be dealing with a body with not very much tissue around the bone. It does look very high status, a member of the elite, and yeah. you'd imagine had a, a very, very uh, high status diet. If there is this evidence of sort of potential emaciation, does that suggest this individual was undernourished? Well, it could be a disease, couldn't it? Or the uh, alternative is a cancer. So could it be that that's causing this? Cancer can cause dramatic weight loss, irrespective of diet. Just like today, it was a problem for the ancient Egyptians, even for young men in the prime of life, like the mummy. There's no good evidence of growths or erosions into tissue, which suggests to me that it is, uh, you know, that, it, that you've got secondary cancers. So no instance. tumors or anything? No tumor evidence there at all, except for the thinness of the body. We might, of course, uh, um, be dealing with a body where the actual tumorous tissue has been removed by the embalmers. Yeah, it's quite so, possible, given yeah. how skilled they were. Yeah, that's right. While the mummy's body shows signs of cancer, the cancerous tissue itself, like the mummy's scrotum, is mysteriously absent. Could these two absences be linked? Today, testicular cancer is relatively rare, but it can still be deadly. 3,000 years ago, it was even deadlier. The problem might be diagnosed, but was impossible to treat. When a cancer sufferer died, the embalmers were known to remove ugly cancerous growths so that their bodies were again perfect for the afterlife. The mummies of Ramesses II and his son Menepta both had their testicles removed. Whether this is evidence of a hereditary vulnerability to cancer or simply a family mummification tradition is hard to say. But crucially, the scans have raised a real possibility for how the mummy died. At Bolton Museum, Don Brothwell joins Stephen Buckley in trying an old technique that could fill out the final branch of the mummy's family tree. Facial reconstruction has brought to life the mummy's extraordinary features, but to prove that they are a family trait, another test is needed. The facial features that determine a person's looks can be scientifically measured and compared with craniofacial measurements of family members. The proportions of the nose and chin can be just as distinctive as fingerprints. What I've seen is some interesting patterns in, in the royal mummies. Yeah. Uh, and there's some hints at, at possible similarities here, so it's a question of you know, what we can get out of that by yeah. doing, yeah. getting accurate measurements here. Accuracy in these measurements is absolutely essential. The tiniest mistake could render the result meaningless. Upper facial that's, height would be nice, that's but... That's a problem, isn't it? That that's one? right. The lip is obscuring the... Uh, hmm. is getting, and, and preventing us getting an accurate measurement. So I think perhaps the X-rays I mean, might provide a, I mean, an accurate measurement there, I think. Yeah. Craniofacial measurements can be taken from a human body or from x-rays. It's an old technique dating back to the 19th century. Nowadays, it's rarely used in modern criminal investigations where DNA has become the single most important tool in positively identifying individuals. But DNA is vulnerable to extremes of temperature and is almost certain to have been destroyed by heat, time and the substances used in embalming. For ancient artefacts like Egyptian mummies, craniofacial measurement will always stand the test of time. Back in York, the final piece of the jigsaw is almost in place. However accurate Stephen's measurements are, they mean nothing on their own. 
To prove scientifically that this mummy is related to Ramesses II, the statistics must be compared with data gathered from Egyptian royal mummies, including Ramesses himself. I looked at uh, all the uh, royal mummies that we have from the New Kingdom. Mm. The one that stands out um, as being most similar to ours is Ramesses II. You know, of these six key measurements, four of them are virtually identical. <laughs> With Ramses II? Yes, with Ramses II. <laughs> the link between these two mummies is not just statistical. The resemblance is more than skin deep. Here's the X-ray of Ramses II. That is so similar. Look at that. Yeah. Look at the nose. The degree of overjet, the, the, angle, overjet. the angle. And the chin. That is such a distinctive yes, chin. Yes, the jaw, the Ramesside jaw. The mummy differs significantly from Ramesses II in only two measurements. Surprisingly, these two rogue statistics actually reinforce the mummy's link to Ramesses through his father, Seti. Other than these couple of measurements here where it's Seti I, who, as we know, was Ramesses II's father. Yeah. So that's, that will be expected from father to son, and then our individual. That's yeah. amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Quite good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the mystery of the mummy's identity appears to be solved at last. He's almost certainly a blood relative of one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. What we find in the skull and in the pelvis is very definite evidence that this is a male. I mean, it is very possible that uh, the mummy and these other individuals have come from the same genetic stock, if you like. I think the chemistry is telling us that this person is, is playing a very careful uh, political and religious game. That is so similar. Look at that. Well, it could be a disease, couldn't it? Or the uh, alternative is a cancer. After weeks of intense work, the investigation has yielded discoveries no one could have anticipated. To come to the point we have, as in a relative of Ramses II, is, is quite mind-blowing. Any one of those pieces of information, if we hadn't had it, if we hadn't found it, could have taken us in a completely yeah. different direction. For me, we just let the science do the talking. Yeah. Um, it speaks for itself. For this mummy, the science speaks volumes. Contrary to the inscriptions on the casket, this mummy is male switched into the casket either in Egypt or during his long journey to Britain and Bolton Museum. The team's painstaking work has painted a picture of a fascinating life and suggested that the mummy could have died of cancer while still young. So, so basically this person had a life of wanting for absolutely nothing, which, which makes you know, the manner of his death such an irony, doesn't it? As Don flagged up, it, it certainly appears to be some sort of wasting disease, mm. possibly even cancer. I mean, that's, that's a tragic irony. This rich, powerful man, who should have enjoyed a comfortable existence at the pinnacle of Egyptian society, was perhaps humbled by a condition that respects neither wealth nor power and still haunts us today. Every time we, we look at the, the mummies, look at the bodies, it's, it's not um, you know, an object in space and time. It's, it's not, um, I don't understand them because this is a statist individual. You, you connect on a very yeah. human way. We aren't looking at just some artifact in a museum. Mm. This is a living, breathing human being mm. that people once loved and once cared for. They had the same fears that we did and the same yeah. felt the same pain that we did. I think that's why it's nice that um, we've gone some way to giving him his identity back. The idea of gaining immortality through mummification might seem strange to us, but in a very real sense, this mummy's embalmers succeeded in their task. Their careful work has ensured that his memory and his identity will endure for thousands of years beyond his death. Somebody here wants this lady to suffer for the rest of eternity. We may have a crime here, but we've got no body. It's certainly a puzzle, uh, and possibly suggests something a little sinister. There's so many suspicious elements to this story, it's really giving me cause for concern. It would just be a world of pain.
mummification, the preservation of dead bodies, became more than a science in ancient Egypt. It developed into a sacred ritual. No other people in history devoted so much time and expense to ensuring a safe passage into the eternal afterlife with their body intact. The skill of Egypt's master embalmers was phenomenal. Thousands of years ago, they worked to halt the ravages of time on lifeless corpses. Today, forensic technology can unlock that person's secrets to reveal the intimate story of their life and death. Over 2,000 miles from Egypt, in a museum in the north of England, lies the beautifully preserved coffin of an Egyptian mummy. But the body inside remains a mystery. The workmanship and sophistication of this coffin suggest that it would have taken weeks, if not months, to create. To be worthy of this top-of-the-range casket, its owner must surely have been a VIP. Dr. Joanne Fletcher is a renowned Egyptologist who's done excavation work and mummy investigations around the world. She's been called in to try and unlock the secrets of this hidden mummy. It came into this country a couple of hundred years ago, and rather than going to the British Museum or another major institution, it came up here to Newcastle. Well, it's obviously an Egyptian mm -hmm. mummy covering. It's obviously female from the, from the exterior, at least. So I'd be quite interested to sort of try and find out more about this individual inside. So I'm really looking forward to sort of seeing the mummy. Um, I'm afraid we can't do that. We really can't open this up because um, we're worried about damaging this beautiful object. So is she completely sealed? Yes, she is. There's no small openings that we could take no. any samples or no. anything now? It's completely, completely sealed. sealed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. this is going to be quite a challenge, I think. First and foremost, what I'd really like to do is take a series of photographs uh, from every angle, pretty much, so I can then go back to mm -hmm. talk with the, the team in York and try and plan some sort of strategy, see what techniques we can bring to bear to study this, uh, this very enigmatic and fascinating mummy. Mm -hmm. This sealed coffin may be an exquisite work of art, but it's also an ancient mystery, thousands of years in the making. Joanne's already nicknamed the hidden mummy, the Lady. And piece by piece, she and the team will have to fill in all the details of who she was, where she's from, and how she met her end. This case will be a massive challenge for the mummy investigation team, given the coffin is sealed and they will never be able to see or touch the mummy within. The team are among the best in their field, but even for them, the task would probably be impossible, except for one thing. Two years ago, for conservation purposes, the museum had the mummy CT scanned. Computed axial tomography is an advanced form of the conventional X-ray. Instead of revealing the outline of bones and organs, the CT scan forms a full three-dimensional computer model of the human body. This medical blueprint of the lady will allow the team to analyze specific areas of the body in great detail. The forensic data will be a priceless tool for the team as they try to uncover how this woman lived and how she died. Dr. Stephen Buckley has an international reputation for his chemical analysis of mummified bodies. His unique experience may unlock a vital clue on this mysterious coffin. Well, from the chemistry, uh, it's certainly possible that some sort of concealment uh, was going on. Egyptologist Jill Scott's specialist knowledge in ancient human remains will be crucial in unravelling the real story of how this mummy died. 
injuries like that, I would expect to be lower down. down. It is That's very correct. high up. And Duncan Lees, who offers forensic support to criminal investigations all over the UK, is going to bring modern detective techniques to the case of this Egyptian mummy. Just because they're 3,000 years old doesn't mean that we can't apply modern forensics and come up with good answers. The lady, like every case, begins with a team briefing here in the incident room at the University of York. Joanne begins with the bad news. We aren't allowed to take this covering off. We aren't allowed to do any physical sampling with this. There is no way into this mummy. The team gets straight into analysing the CT scan data. What interests me here is this, um, this sort of package, which I'm guessing is part of the um, embalming process, the mummification, uh, internal organs wrapped in there. But there is a lot that we can do. I mean, using technology that, that, that uh, Stephen will be applying as well, um, that looks through the coffin, looks into the interior, and builds up still three-dimensional information that will be a good starting point for us to create a virtual reality person. The whole premise with this one is it's a completely, you know, hands-off zone. We're not allowed to touch. But using this technology to penetrate through the wrappings, through the coffin, we can hopefully then, you know, really bring this woman back to life. The team have state-of-the-art forensic technology like a CT scan at their disposal. But if they're going to unlock the secrets of this sealed coffin, they'll have to do so with absolutely no access to the body within. To get things started, they're going back to basics. Jill Scott is hard at work. She's already unearthed the museum's acquisition records and has discovered that back in the 1820s, when the coffin of this mummy first came into the country, it was opened at the base by the feet. The damage that was done during this operation is one reason why the museum insists the coffin must now remain sealed. Further analysis of the records reveals details that will help them build a profile of the mummy. What we appear to have is a mummy dating from the 21st, 22nd dynasty. So we're looking around 1070 to 900 BC as, as a sort of rough date there. The records state that the name of this mummy is Bakht Hornat, which means servant of Horus the Strong which makes sense as a name for an Egyptian female. And what we also have is a location. We have it mentioned here that she was found in a tomb at Gurna in Thebes, which is a really interesting place. Set along both sides of the River Nile, near the modern city of Luxor, lies the ancient city of Thebes. It was for a while prominent as a royal residence, the capital city and the religious heart of Egypt. It contained the necropolis in the Valley of the Kings and numerous funerary temples such as the Ramesseum, built by Ramesses II. But for all its architectural splendor, Thebes was at the center of a bitter rivalry that had split ancient Egypt in two. The south around Thebes is entirely controlled by the priests. So you've got these elite priest kings, these powerful, powerful dynasts that, that control the whole area. So whoever Our Lady was, she was very much under the thumb of these priests, both on a, a religious and, I'd say, a political level. And I think the thing that interests me most of all is this Mona Lisa-type smile to her, really enigmatic, and it kind of makes you wonder what's actually going on underneath this coffin lay. You know, what is she hiding? In order to find out more about the lady, the team need to establish what she looked like in life. But with her body sealed in a coffin, this won't be easy. They've brought in an expert in cranial facial identification. Steph Davy Jow uses her expertise on criminal investigations and archaeological cases. 
Taking the data from the CT scan, her computerized reconstruction model will reveal this woman's face for the first time in thousands of years. This is a virtual 3D model of her skull. Rather than showing you how she would have looked now, I can show you what she would have looked like at the end of her life. Steph has identified a number of changes to the woman's facial structure caused by the process of mummification. Her jaw had been rotated into an open position. Okay. And her nasal bones had been broken, likely when they removed her brain. Okay. So I rotated the mandible back into its natural position. And I've taken the nasal bones, a bit like pieces of a puzzle, I was able to rotate them back into where they would have been. Using standard tissue depth markers, Steph is able to accurately recreate the thickness of the skin all over the mummy's face. The next stage of the process is to add eyes. These are obviously quite important to the final appearance of the face. All the pieces are beginning to click into place as the face of the mummy is slowly building. So I've begun to add skin. Essentially, I've built a grid using the tissue depths and the muscles to build the outer features of the face. Is this a, a generic sort of mesh that, of, that you've attached to the head, or, or does this build up as a sort of bespoke data set for this individual? I make it bespoke each time, especially in, in regions such as the eyes and the lips. It's very personal to the skull beneath. With the face almost complete, Steph starts to add the finishing touches. Here's an image rendered of what she looks like without hair. Okay. Quite statuesque, I think. Incredible. Very, well, beautiful and very striking mm. as well. Very strong um, features. To build an accurate picture of her hairstyle, Steph has modelled it on the painting of the lady's hair on the outside of the coffin. And there she is. That is extraordinary. This is how she would have appeared on the day that she died. The face of a 3,000-year-old mummy. The ability to accurately rebuild the face of this Egyptian woman as it was the day she died almost 3,000 years ago is an astonishing achievement for the mummy investigation team. Especially as they've managed to do it without even opening the coffin. Now that you've finished the reconstruction and, and spent so long working on it, what clues are, are hidden away in her face that you've managed to draw out? Well, you can see she was a quite striking looking woman. And you can see here she's got quite um, an extensive overbite. And based on her overbite, we can say with some confidence that she was likely of high status. This has been shown um, in various research outputs. An overbite is the vertical overlapping of the upper teeth over the lower teeth. It's a classic facial feature of Egyptian royalty. A physical characteristic dating back to the lineage of pharaohs like Tutankhamun in the 18th dynasty. This important discovery backs up the theory that the mummy was a high-status Egyptian female. The mummy investigation team are among the first people to lay eyes on the lady's facial features in almost three millennia. Using museum records, the team has also confirmed her position at the top of Egyptian society, probably originating from the city of Thebes during the 21st to 22nd dynasty. But they are still no closer to working out exactly who she was or how she died. Joanne is hoping that the hieroglyphs on the coffin could provide a vital lead. This ancient writing system contains a combination of symbols and alphabetic elements. Hieroglyphs were an essential component of mummification, as all Egyptian coffins had to correctly display the name of the person inside to ensure a safe passage into the afterlife.
They were first deciphered in 1822 by French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion, who realized that the Rosetta Stone was inscribed with the same text in both Greek and hieroglyphs, an event that gave birth to the science of Egyptology. Alan Fields specializes in deciphering this ancient Egyptian writing, and his knowledge could unlock the secrets of this sealed coffin. In his analysis of the hieroglyphs, Alan has noticed a series of anomalies. Ever since she was brought to Britain, she's been known as Bakht Hornacht, which means servant of Horus the Strong. But that's not what is actually written on the coffin. So we've got ba Ke. Yeah. Then we've got a very hurried uh, water sign. It is hurried, isn't very it? Very hurried. They've not done a zigzag like no, normal. Which they've... I'm sure would have been as easy as enough to write the water sign as it is to do that line. So we have Baket and Hor. Which translates as simply servant of Horus. Then I see Nakt, Baket and Hor Nakt. The word Nakt, meaning strong, is separated from Bakht and Hor by the equivalent of a full stop. This means the name actually reads as Bakht and Hor full stop. Adding a Nakt seems to be a mistake by whoever transcribed it for the museum. For over 200 years, this mummy has been given the wrong name, Servant of Horus the Strong, instead of her true name, Servant of Horus. Remembering the names of the dead was sacred to ancient Egyptians. They probably valued the afterlife more than any other culture in history. They believed that death was simply a temporary interruption and that eternal life could be ensured by preservation of the physical form through mummification. The pharaohs in particular were so obsessed with the afterlife that they ordered the construction of vast and complex tombs to protect their bodies for this journey into the next world. The 19th century mistranslation of the name is one thing, but the original scribe also seems to have made a mistake. Everything else is That's actually just it. spot on. Everything it's well else done. Does work. And then we come to the major part of the inscription, and suddenly we send the wrong person. So is we can't say with any certainty the name of this lady. Exactly. Which means she, she can't live again. She can't. The description of the lady's status, a vital insignia for the afterlife, contains what must be a deliberate error. This woman is called Lord of the House. Absolutely. And she's a lady of the house. Yeah. She's not a man, she's a woman. Yeah. So at the top, they've got the sex wrong, which is pretty fundamental. It's maximum to hurt, isn't it? It's the maximum kind of thing you can do to this lady to affect her. Yeah, it was totally misrepresenting yes. what she was in life. A gut instinct would be that, I'd, that, that somebody didn't want this person to live in the next world. An error so obvious as that, um, somebody wanted to do mischief. A thing so crucial as a name, a thing that was going to take you and get you, allow you into the next world, a thing that you couldn't live without. No, it's a major, major error. Or has it been done for a reason? The deliberate misrepresentation of the mummy's title has thrown the case wide open, leading Joanne and Alan to consider who would have wanted to sabotage the lady's passage into the afterlife. Well, there are a number of suspects, aren't they? So if we list the subjects, we can actually have a look at them. There's the family, yeah. there's the scribes, and there's the priesthood. Could have been any of the three. Let's face it, what, what percent of um, Egyptians could read and write in this period? Exactly, Maybe I mean, two 1%, or five, one percent. So a scribe could get away with that. Yes. Without 98% of people even well, looking at it. Well, who know? Who would know what the scribe had written? That begs the question what's going on inside this card tonight? Absolutely. Symbolic damage was done to the inscription on the lady's coffin. The team now needs to establish whether any physical harm was done to her body. Since they will never see inside the coffin, Duncan has decided to use the images from the CT scan to create a precise model of the mummy's head. 
facial reconstruction established what this woman looked like while alive. Now he wants to know what she looks like today, sealed inside her coffin. 3D design specialist David Moore will take data from the CT scan to form a replica model of the mummy's head. Commonly known as rapid prototyping, this state-of-the-art technique will allow the team to turn the digital data into a 3D physical reality. We have a fundamental problem with this, with this, object, with this body, David, in that we can't actually see her. Um, we've got this CAT scan data, but we really need a visualisation. We need, really need to sort of look her in the eye if we're going to solve the case. Well, see, the problem we've got here is 3,000-year-old mummy is a lot of those tissues have sort of ab absorbed into each other and become attached to the skull and things like that. So what we're, what we're really going to have to do is push the boundaries of the software slightly and try and really pick out just the material that we want. Three-dimensional printers build up the specific design by printing thousands of successive layers. The model is then created by alternating layers of glue and chalk powder. The 3D result is a dimensionally accurate head based on the source data from the CT scan. If you're observing a real mummy, you have to be so delicate, you mm -hmm. know, contamination, all, all, everything that goes with that. What you've got here is an exact representation of what's lying within the casket, yet you don't have to be delicate with it. You can slice it in half, see what's inside. In a way, you haven't actually got a body here. You're looking at data. Continuing to build the profile of the lady, Joanne Fletcher is trying to gain clues from one of the oldest forms of forensic ID that exists. Teeth. Dr. Ian McLeod is a leading dental radiologist who specializes in the analysis of Egyptian mummies. One of the things we can see straight away, she's got a full set of teeth, including, importantly, her wisdom teeth, the third molars. And in most people, the third molar erupts in your mouth at around the age of about 18. And it takes another sort of three years for the roots to completely form. So if we look carefully, we can see these roots are fully formed. Yeah. So automatically, we can say this lady's over the age of 21. But if we look at this lady's teeth, we can see that uh, this is the first molar. This erupts around the age of six. The second molar erupts around the age of 12. And as we've said, the third molar about 18. Once the teeth are in the mouth, they start to wear. And in ancient Egypt, in fact, they, they probably wore their teeth quite rapidly. And if we look at the top of the teeth there, we can see that's worn quite a lot. This is a little less worn, and this one's worn, but not to a huge degree. So putting these sort of facts together, in fact, it gives us an age of around 30 at death. Life was hard for most people living in ancient Egypt, and the average life expectancy was low. A woman in her mid-40s would be considered elderly. So the fact that the lady was around 30 years old when she died makes it unlikely that she died of old age. Meanwhile, the 3D visualization of the mummy is almost ready. Without even laying a finger on the coffin, Duncan is about to see exactly what the lady's head looks like. Fantastic, isn't it? Mm. And this is one-to-one -one scale data, so you're not it reduced no. or changed in any way the dimensions. No. So she has a very delicate small head, She's doesn't she? Yeah. It's incredible to be looking into her face. And yeah. I wonder who the last person she was looking at was.
thousands of years after her death. The mummy investigation team are trying to piece together how and why this Egyptian woman died. So far, they know her name, her date of origin, and where she lived. And even though she remains sealed in a coffin, the team now has an extraordinary image of what the lady once looked like. They're now reconvening to try to work out their next step. What we have isn't just a, a confusion with the name. There's certainly confusion with this woman's job title, the job description. We've got clear evidence of misspelling because these signs should read Nebet Pair, which means lady of the house. Right. And quite categorically, that's not what it says. When you look carefully, they've purposefully missed out the feminine T sign. So, so they're basically calling her a him. Exactly. Exactly, right. and this is categorically wrong. And, and that's completely contradicting the ancient Egyptian belief systems. So I've had, we've had a good step forward as well with the, uh, with the data from the, the cloud mapping, from the point cloud data that we've derived from the CT scan. And this is going to be the only chance I think we get to look at um, her in real life. And here she is. Stephen is a world authority on mummification techniques. He immediately notices a glaring discrepancy. What um, concerns me and I notice is the, um, the difference between the uh, fine decorated cartonnage uh, uh, and the state of the, uh, of the face. You see the, um, the sort of undulation here. Um, it's almost like it's blistered or something, isn't it? Egyptian embalmers were highly sophisticated chemists who developed their art over thousands of years. A good embalmer would have preserved facial features to an incredibly high standard. But the 3D model has revealed the opposite. It's certainly not what you'd expect of um a decent embalmer mm. um, at this time. There is definitely an inconsistency here, right? And I think I think that's something that needs looking at. Where I would go now with this is is to look at the body and to see whether you see it there. Sure. The evidence for foul play is building up. the team now need to find a cause of death for the lady. Using a printout of the CT scan, Duncan is consulting Surgeon Commander Mike Edwards, who serves with the British forces. He's seen practically every kind of injury to the human body. Armed with the CT scan data, he may be able to tell what has happened to the lady's body. After careful analysis, Mike is able to answer the question that has remained unknown for 3,000 years. How this woman died. If we look on the CT scan here, we can see that there is a massive incision or stab wound, it's whatever major, you want to call it. It is major and it's not regular at all. It's ragged and irregular and extends very deeply. We're not talking about the, the mummification wound, the embalmer's incision here. No, we're not, because this is more likely to be the embalming incision, because it's in the left loin and left hypochondrial yeah, region. Which is, which and is it's very, normal, isn't it? And it's very neat. Yeah. The large wound identified is completely separate from the standard embalming incision, which is also visible on the CT scan. This presents the team with a dramatic development. I suspect the wound is here. OK. And this uh, extends, if, if a, a, a knife were placed through the abdomen, mm -hmm. it would have gone through this small bowel here, large bowel here, mm -hmm. maybe even into the liver here and the large vessels at the back of the abdomen. Why do we think this is a wound from a stabbing rather than, say, damage from impaling yourself or falling on something, you know, that sort of thing? 
Well, I think, I think I'll go further than that. I think this is an assassination. I think the sight of the wound tells us and the size of the wound. If we're imagining that I'm attacking you from the front, yeah. and if I'm coming in and I'm trying to stab you here, yeah, be your hands are going to be all over the place, I'm going to be trying stabbing you here, mm -hmm. here and here. And certainly not up and under. Certainly like not that. up and under, and there's liable to be cuts on the arms. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and which, it, which we don't see. Which we so. don't see. Right. We see a large irregular wound in the right hypochondrial region. Our assassin would approach from behind. Right. I step from the rear, hand over the mouth, hand goes up, I twist my body in, knife rams up, then spinning it around and moving it around as much as possible to do the maximum amount of damage before pulling the blade out and making a run for it. The violence of the stab wound would have caused extreme trauma to the liver, leaving the lady in unbearable pain. The reason it will be so nasty with the liver is it's an incredibly vascular organ. It's right. got so many blood vessels going through it to, to do the job that it does in the body. Now, here's our weapon. Now, you can imagine that if this is penetrating through, the abdominal wall goes up into the liver and lacerates here and he gruddles it around and he does as much damage as he possibly can. And you can see yeah, just how vascular this liver is and all these little bile ducts yeah. here and blood vessels. This would have been pumping out blood, you know, at the rate of knots. Incredibly messy then, I mean, a lot of obvious signs. A lot, a lot of blood and guts. Mm. The guts would have been prolapsing out the wound. There had been an enormous amount of blood. So we have this, this graphic evidence for this vicious and violent and terminal uh, assault on this 30-year-old woman. How long, you know, how long would it have been before she died? What would have been that sequence, do you think? I, I would think it would just have been a matter of minutes. Mm. Uh, if the, the knife had penetrated even deeper and, and maybe taken out the major vessels, right. the back death would have been, you know, in under a minute. Through her oh, mind must have been oh, passing all of that uh, family and relations and what's happened and why has it happened and f just amazing fear. I would have think it would just be a world of pain. With the shocking revelation that this mummy was violently murdered, the team now need to work out why someone would have wanted to kill the lady. In a search for more clues, Joanne and Jill are trawling through the Egyptian archives at the Literary and Philosophical Society Library in Newcastle. It has an extensive historical collection of books, periodicals and newspaper reports charting the birth of Egyptology as a science in the early 19th century. The Society hosted a public exhibition of the mummy when it first arrived in the country almost 200 years ago in 1821. All right. Oh, what you got there? Oh, lots of treats for us to look at. Excellent. I've come across this one, which actually look quite interesting. It's the reports, papers and catalogues mm. of the Literary and Philosophical Society from Newcastle upon Tyne, mm. 1820 to 1821. Yeah. So that's coinciding with our date. But if we have a look through, it's quite a strange book in its nature. It's more like a scrapbook, actually. And I think if we just have a sort through. Oh, yeah. It's all. Handwriting. Yeah. Very beautiful handwriting, but then you've got small yeah. articles. Like newspaper clippings. Like newspaper clippings. But the book contains more than just newspaper articles. It's about to reveal a very big clue. Okay. Well, God. that's interesting. <laughs> A, a specimen of the cloth and cord taken from the mummy at the Literary and Philosophical Society in Newcastle and Tyne. I'll let you do the honours. Oh, 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 oh. oh this here is we go. Good, very, very careful. <laughs> what a result. That's incredible. Look at that. They this have kept amazing. it in a book 
That's fabulous. That's for over fabulous. 200 years. <laughs> it's still very dusty. It actually. is, yeah, let's close it up. That is, oh. I've just breathed in that to our neck, Terry. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> What a discovery! You don't usually make archaeological discoveries in a library, do you? From the start of the investigation, the team had no access to the mummy or interior of the coffin, so the finding of these linen samples is a huge breakthrough. Tiny fragments of the linen wrappings are cut off to be taken away for chemical analysis in Stephen's lab. The entire embalming process would take around 70 days and was performed by priests and embalmers who had a detailed knowledge of the human anatomy. Some organs would be removed to avoid decay. The body cavity was then packed with linen and spices before the body was finally wrapped in many layers of linen cloth. It's these linen wrappings that Stephen is analyzing for their chemical fingerprint. Through GCMS, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, he will be able to identify the chemical compounds present on the linen sample. The technique works on the principle that every chemical turns to a gas at a specific temperature. By gradually heating the microscopic samples taken from the linen, it should reveal the many hundreds of compounds it contains by examining the point at which they turn to gas. This will provide a chemical fingerprint of each of the components used to embalm the mummy. Well, I've never sampled from a book before, but uh, it's looking quite interesting. And what we actually have is a ruminant fat mixed with castor oil balsam trace of coniferous and a trace of beeswax. Is that all? Yes, that's all. Is there nothing particularly exotic? No, not really, no. Well, surely you'd expect a, a few more exotic commodities, given the status of this woman. That sounds rather like a collection of somewhat mundane ingredients. There does seem to be a contradiction here between the materials used and the quality of the cartonage we see. So I suppose that the question we should think about is, is why? But you, you see here um, the combustion markers, which we see if something has been very strongly heated. So it perhaps suggests um, that someone was in a rush rather than doing a good job. The GCMS test has not only identified that relatively cheap materials were used in this embalming, but also that the materials used had been severely overheated. This correlates with the results from the three-dimensional print of the mummy's head, displaying large amounts of decomposition, also indicating an incompetent and rushed embalming. This is highly suspicious, as the mummification of members of Egyptian high society was a precise and delicate art. No, it just doesn't add up. The way she no. was mummified, the ingredients aren't what one would expect no. in her apparent status. So what's going on? I'm not quite sure. Uh, and possibly suggest something a little sinister. The results of the chemical analysis indicate that the violent stabbing of Bakhten Hor was just the first of a series of heinous crimes to be committed against this Egyptian woman. Professor Don Brothwell has been conducting further analysis. He's a leading physical anthropologist who specializes in paleopathology and in analyzing anomalies in the human anatomy. Using the three-dimensional data from the CT scan, he's identified a shocking new development. Well, I've been looking through this area of the head and neck. So if we get these CT scans and move through from the face back into the throat area there, first of all, you can see the tongue in the jaw. And as you move back 
towards the neck region. Nothing then in the throat area. There's no, there's no windpipe or anything there at all. They've slit under the tongue, removed the windpipe and so on, cleaned it up, and then inserted a large wadge of, I would think, linen or something of that sort of that. I mean, my feeling is that that was a decision which they took for some carefully thought out reason. And it might have, in fact, you know, infringed the usual policies in terms of embalming. So you're saying this was a premeditated move? A part of their technique. Yeah, which is something I've never seen in any other mummy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the complete removal of, of this part of the body. Yeah. Well, it it's... wasn't a standard part of the procedure, was it? Well, it is here. Of all the human organs required after death, the throat was one of the most important for ancient Egyptians. According to their belief system, the deceased had to be able to speak his or her own name to the god Osiris, lord of the afterlife, to then be judged upon entry into the eternal paradise for the soul. In the eyes of ancient Egyptians, removal of the throat during mummification would prevent this sacred ritual from taking place. Why take out the throat, the voice box, the, the very organs that are required, we know, to breathe again in the next world, to speak your name in the next world? Yeah. When she's there before the gods, she physically cannot speak her name before yeah. them. She yeah. can't identify herself. The cartonage can't identify her. So, yeah. It, it does give me some, some cause for concern, yeah. I think. From the very beginning, this case of the sealed coffin looked almost impossible as the mummy investigation team were denied any kind of access to the body. Against all odds and through a combination of forensic excellence and old-fashioned detective work, they've built an incredible picture of who this woman was and how she died. Based on her overbite, we can say with some confidence that she was likely of high status. Well, from the chemistry, uh, it's certainly possible that some sort of concealment uh, was going on. I'll go further than that. I think this is an assassination. There's the family, there's the scribes, and there's the priesthood. But it could have been any of the three. Without even laying a finger on the body, the mummy investigation team has discovered that this woman was murdered by a savage knife attack to the abdomen. She was robbed of her life, and even worse in Egyptian eyes, robbed of her passage into the next world. This was sabotaged by a hurried embalming, the removal of her throat, and the incorrect inscription of her title on the coffin. She was murdered in real life and in the afterlife. It's been very gratifying for me that we've actually been able to make this person live again in a physical sense um, when we've had absolutely no access to the body. I think what was interesting for me was the chemistry, because um, it really pointed to um, a rush job. Centuries she's been called backed whore knacked, when actually what she really was called is backed in whore. Merely saying that is to revive her soul. One thing is clear someone with huge power and influence hated her so much. She really did live in this world of pain for the, the awful few seconds before she passed away. They killed her twice.
I get the feeling that he's not met a happy and content and peaceful demise. They had lots of harsh punishments. We have burning of the body, general mutilation of the body, and certainly beheading. This kind of status of mummification, this standard, isn't given to just anyone. Just because they're 3,000 years old doesn't mean that we can't apply modern forensics and come up with good answers. If the man wasn't dead already, it certainly would have killed him. Incredible force, incredible violence. Mummies, the preserved remains of the dead, are a unique window to the past. Cultures like the ancient Egyptians, convinced they'd need their bodies in the afterlife, went to extraordinary lengths to develop advanced embalming techniques to prevent the natural decay that occurs after death. Thousands of years on, science allows us to decode the secrets of these preserved bodies to reveal astounding details about the world these individuals lived in, the key facts about their lives, and for many, how they met their deaths. Over 2,000 miles from Egypt, in a museum in the north of England, lies a mummified head. No one knows how it came to be separated from its body. And with just a fragment of this individual to work on, the mummy investigation team is looking at a major challenge. We don't know who he was, how old he was when he died. We don't know where the body has gone. We don't know why the head's just, just as it is. We've got so many questions that need to be answered. But we know he's from Egypt then, I take it. Yes, yes we do, yes. Yeah. But that's pretty much all. <laughs> Fair enough. So, I mean, we can say, looks like an adult male from Egypt. He's obviously yes. being mummified. So, you want us to do what we can to try and give you some answers? Absolutely. It has to be said, we are used to dealing with complete bodies, not just body parts. So, we will have our work cut out with just the head, but I'm sure we'll be able to pin down some actual answers to sort of really put flesh on his bones and really put him into his sort of ancient context for you. Team leader, Dr. Joanne Fletcher, is a renowned Egyptologist. She's examined mummies all over the world, but this could be her toughest case ever. First things first, I always like to undertake a, a thorough visual examination, have a good sort of face-to-face. -face. The mummification levels are so superb. I mean, the quality of the preservation of the soft tissue. I mean, look at the profile, that nose is exquisite. Yeah. Um, very rarely do you have that. Usually the nose is flattened to the face with the tightness of the linen wrappings. It's very poignant, in fact, because the expression is, is retained. Mm. So it's, it's almost as if he's looking back at us. This man could have died in a thousand different ways, and with no body to work on, all the team's theories will have to be drawn from the head alone. Bit by bit, the mummy investigation team will try to fill in the elusive details of who this man once was, where he lived, and if possible, how he died. Each member of this well-established team brings a unique set of skills. Duncan Lees works with London's Metropolitan Police and MI5. He'll bring his very special forensic skills to bear on this ancient Egyptian. We're very much a team. Different experience and expertise has to be combined. Dr Stephen Buckley is a pioneer in the chemical analysis of mummification. 
he is one of the very few people in the world able to identify some of the vital chemical clues hidden in this head. The embalmers knew their stuff. And Egyptologist Jill Scott's specialist knowledge of ancient human remains will be vital in trying to unravel the real story of how the mummy died. In forensics, we need physical hardcore evidence. The team is about to be briefed at their HQ in the historic city of York. What they want to know is who is this person, how did he die, and is there any evidence of foul play? So the, the photos obviously clearly show just a head, and, and unless there is a, a photos missing, that's all we've got. Is that the case? What you see is what you get. This is it. It's just a head. And we're used to having complete bodies when we've done other mummy studies, but this is it. It's just the mummified head. So we're really going to have to work hard on this one to pull together all the expertise to try and come up with some answers. I'm going to treat this in the same way that we treat modern cases. This, this a modern murder even. Just because this person is of antiquity doesn't mean that the evidence won't be there for how he died. The photographs prompt the team to ask plenty of questions. On these, these awful neck injuries. I mean, something's gone on there that's... Was it an axe? Was it a, some sort of blade? Was it a garrote? How did this head, you know, how was it removed from the body? And is it linked to the wounds that we've got above the right eye socket? Yeah. I mean, was this individual decapitated, really? Did he suffer trauma from stabbing or from, um, from battery, blunt objects, that kind of thing? The first thing that I'm going to need to do is to go back to the archives and see what I can dig up on this person. Um, it'll be interesting to find out when they actually came into the country and see if that's going to fit in with what the science is going to tell us about this person yeah. and the status and how they've lived. So, what, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we can pinpoint him yeah. exactly where in Egypt and when exactly well, in Egypt, yeah. because that has a lot of yeah. bearing the chronology, right. doesn't it? That's right, and I think that the modification can help the materials used change through time. Uh, so if we can identify these, getting a chemical fingerprint of these materials, we can get some idea of who this person was and something about status as well. It's only now that we have uh, the technology has come a long way and we're able to look at answering the questions. Two years ago we wouldn't have been in a position to do this, but now we have a really good chance to, to bring technology to bear on a, on a several thousand year old head and answer the questions about how this poor man died my main concern in this case that it is just a head so we have to sort of be cautious that there's only so much that we're ever going to be able to find out most of the evidence which could throw light on this man's life and maybe explain his death is missing along with his body so it's going to be a tough task to try to unravel this ancient mystery Members of the mummy investigation team are combining the latest forensic techniques to try to determine exactly how this ancient Egyptian died. But even with all their technology, they're still hindered by the fact the body from the neck down is missing. Stephen is collecting skin samples from the head for a GCMS test. It's the first time the head has been subjected to chemical analysis since it was discovered. This will enable Stephen to identify individual chemical compounds used to embalm the head. And the compounds can answer questions about how the man was mummified. It can pick up minute traces of, uh, of a number of things, so we need to be uh, very careful about the sampling side um, so that what we don't pick up is, is uh, modern contamination, for example. His sampling also has to be carried out with precision or he risks damaging the priceless mummy. The mummification will uh, provide um, quite a few clues as to, as to who he was. The, uh, the standard is excellent and, and the materials that we find can certainly help us to put him in his, his proper place in, in history. The equipment is so sensitive that it could detect two drops of blood 
in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Continuing to build the mummy's profile, analysis of his hair could add more information to the emerging picture. It can tell us about the quality of the man's diet, a strong indication of his social status. What I'll be doing when I get back to the lab is to um, extract the organic materials, the organic residues uh, from the samples uh, I've got, get a chemical fingerprint, um, and then of those individual components, put back together the materials employed, and that can really be very, very valuable in, in telling us about the life that this person uh, was involved with. Meanwhile, forensic archaeologist Duncan Lees is using a three-dimensional laser scanner to build a virtual model of the mummy. The scan will create an exact digital version of the head, essential for the team's work. What we're using is a laser scanner here to create a dimensionally accurate model um, that we can then investigate without touching the head itself. If we're going to start looking at um, you know, any damage, any lesions, any fractures, any compression that we find, and perhaps trying to relink that to, to weapons or objects or anything else that become a, a sensible hypothesis for the, the cause of death, then that's much better done in a, in a virtual environment. The scanner uses the same echo principle as radar, but using laser light. The laser beam scans the surface of the subject, creating 20,000 precisely measured points every second. This incredibly detailed information is sent back to the computer, which generates a precise three-dimensional virtual model. It has phenomenal accuracy. The margin of error is just 20 microns, 20 millionths of a meter less than the width of a human hair. I get the feeling that he's, he's not met a happy and content and peaceful demise. Um, and we need to do him the, the service and, the, and, and, if you like, give him the justice of trying to find out, to the best of our abilities, um, how he died and, and put that on record. I think he's waited long enough for that. Before the team can work out how the man died, they must first try to give him his life back by establishing who he was and where and when he lived. The head was donated to the Newcastle Museum in the late 19th century. One of the very few clues the museum was able to pass on to the team was the suggestion that the mummified head originated from the Old Kingdom period of ancient Egypt. This is around the third millennium BC, over 4,000 years ago, when Egypt attained its first great peak of civilization. This was the time of the magnificent pyramids at Giza. At this stage in Egyptian history, mummification was relatively new and relied heavily on the use of natron salts, a simple mixture containing carbonate and bicarbonate of soda. When a body was packed in natron salts, moisture was drawn out of the skin in a vital part of the mummification process. With little else done to the body, Old Kingdom mummies are quite easily identifiable, as they tend to be poorly preserved. But in this case, with no body to work on, it's back to some traditional research work for Joanne and Jill. They still need to find a way of working out where he came from and when. I've been rummaging around in the archives and I've managed to come up with a bit of information on this guy. Um, we know that he was donated in uh, 1877 mm. and was actually found in Egypt at the site of Saqqaran. Well, that's, that's pretty good news, actually, because that places him geographically in northern Egypt, Memphis. That's fantastic. We've really sort of got an idea of provenance now. The link to the burial site of Saqqara is a significant development, 
as this was the graveyard for the capital city, Memphis. It was where Egypt's rulers and elite were laid to rest. Clearly, there is an astonishingly high level of mummification going on here. It's, it's not your standard stuff. It's really well done. I, know, I, I, I do think, certainly, there is a very good chance that he would have been about royal duties in his everyday professional life, because this kind of status of mummification, this standard, isn't given to just anyone. This is really the creme de la creme, I think. To have survived thousands of years with so much detail like the eyelids, ears and hair intact suggests that this man was mummified to a very high standard, far higher than anything achieved in the Old Kingdom. I think looking at the mummification techniques, we're dealing with something certainly at least a thousand years after that. Right. I think the mummification techniques at the moment are pointing towards a date 1200 to 1000 BC. This revised date for the head's origin could be the first break in the case. The quality of mummification suggests the mummy dates from the later part of the New Kingdom, closer to around 1000 BC. The New Kingdom was the time of some of Egypt's most famous rulers, such as Tutankhamun and Ramesses II. Adjusting the head's date of origin by over a thousand years has huge implications. The results of the GCMS test could provide the definitive proof. Gas chromatography mass spectrometry is the gold standard of chemical analysis, crucial to criminal investigations. The machine works on the principle that every chemical turns to a gas at a particular temperature. By gradually heating the microscopic samples taken from the head, the test should reveal the hundreds of component compounds by examining the point at which they turn to gas. This will provide a chemical fingerprint of the substances used to embalm him. What we've got with the uh, material on, on the skin is uh, a plant oil. Castor oil is one of the main ingredients. Uh, conifer resin, uh, but as a pitch, a strongly heated pitch. Why strongly heated? I think um, the rest of the chemistry is giving us clues, and I think in this case it may be to actually uh, darken it, to blacken ah. it. Um, because we also see bitumen in here, but it's only a minor component. Uh, but the fact that it's there at all is helpful. The minute chemical components of bitumen, which Stephen has identified, are an important discovery. Black was the traditional colour of Egypt and also represented life. So the blackening of mummies during embalming may have been a way to display national identity. This development could redate the mummy to an even later period than Joanne suspected. Uh, the use of bitumen here excludes the New Kingdom as a possible source. Uh, it only really came into its own 700, 600 BC. This result is a hard fact the team has been hoping for. Modern science has helped date the mummy to the late period, around 700 to 400 BC. It's about 2,000 years later than the museum's records suggested. The team have now established that this man almost certainly lived in the ancient Egyptian city of Memphis in the late period. This was the last great flowering of Egyptian culture, the final centuries of the glorious era of the pharaohs. Egypt was very much trying to sort of establish its cultural identity, you know, with this onslaught of all these, these foreigners into its yeah. country. At a time when the Egyptians were feeling that they had to reassert their own national identity. Yeah. Yeah. And we're doing it in a number of ways, including through the mummification. But Stephen's scientific analysis yields even more results. In the hair sample, which we can compare with the skin, we do actually see a very similar uh, chemical fingerprint, a very similar pattern with the castor oil, the conifer pitch, and, um, and the balsam. 
uh, and the bitumen. But what we also have is beeswax. It obviously wouldn't have been cheap. So these mixtures wouldn't have been available to just anyone then? No, they wouldn't. The GCMS test has built a much clearer profile of our mystery man. It's told us where he lived and when. And amazingly, it has also identified exotic conifer and beeswax traces in his hair. Both these substances were used in the manufacture of wigs, a popular status symbol for members of Egyptian high society. Filippo Salamone has been researching the rituals and methods of ancient Egyptian hair and wig making for almost 10 years. Using techniques thousands of years old, Filippo has carefully reconstructed the kind of hairpiece a high-status Egyptian man, like this mummy, might have worn. Phil, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. One of the things that I did learn um, very, very quickly when making this wig was um, just how skilled they were, um, probably more so than they are today, because everything was done, obviously, by hand. Yeah. And um, without the modern tools, this intricate hairpiece has taken Filippo four months to create, and he's used one of the very substances discovered by Stephen in the mummy's hair. The ancient Egyptians did attach each piece individually yeah. um, by the use of beeswax, oh, yeah. by um, drawing the piece of hair along. Yeah. Judging by um, the amount of time and effort and energy it's actually gone to creating this wig, I feel as though he, he would have been somebody of wealth. What we have is the wig is a status item because not only by wearing it to appear different to the vast majority of people in society at that time, you're also sending out the, the, sig the sort of signal that I have enough wealth at my disposal mm. to have people make these things for me. Mm -hmm. And that, that does raise the sort of question, I mean, would he have been so well marked out in society mm -hmm. to have him, you know, made himself a target, perhaps? I mean, could he have been a, a victim of a random act of violence or even mugging? Yes, I was going to say. All these ideas come into your head because, you know, you just can't help it when you look at this wig and you imagine him wearing it. The investigation is gathering momentum. A picture is emerging of the man's life, status and even appearance, but the team still has no idea how he died. Jill has returned to the Egyptian archives in Newcastle. She's looking for evidence of the practice of beheading in late period ancient Egypt. These are all images by Baron Dominique Vivant Denon, who was with Napoleon during his conquest of Egypt. And, you know, he's gone around and he's drawn scenes that he's found in tombs and monuments. And we have some fantastic images of a man here holding a knife with a person beheaded. So his head's on the floor and he's bound to a post. Now, that is perfectly feasible for what's happened to our guy if you actually look at the wounds. So that's actually quite interesting. These have been taken from tombs and monuments, so we know that they do exist, and they definitely show people being beheaded whilst alive as some sort of punishment or ritual. We have all of this evidence here that is saying that it definitely went on in ancient times, which is really important. So people were definitely beheaded at the time. But is that how this mummy lost his life? Joanne has decided to consult a radiologist to investigate beheading as a cause of death. Dr Ian McLeod specialises in the analysis of Egyptian mummies. I think if the head had been beheaded, as it were, I would have expected to see a cleaner cut 
you know, where a, a nax or a sword or something would have cut into the flesh. Well, what we've got here is a sort of more ragged sort of damage. It's, it's not clean at all. It's it? not clean at all. It, it's almost as if it's snapped off. Which would uh, explain these kind of raggy areas. Absolutely. Is this muscle or? It, it is partly muscle and the, the skin on the outside, absolutely right. And we can just see part of the bone poking oh, through yeah. the, the inside of that. So it looks as if it's just snapped off at some time over the history. So basically we can discount uh, beheading as, as the cause of death? I think it's highly unlikely this individual was beheaded. I'm also very, very intrigued by this quite nasty wound over the right eye. And at first you think it must be a post-mortem wound, the soft tissues come away and so forth, but there's definitely damage to the bone. We know that one of the ways the ancient Egyptians, certainly the pharaohs, liked to execute enemies was to sort of use brute force and bring down a stone mace mm. into their skull mm. and it often occurs around this area around the brow area well it's difficult to say just looking at it because i mean some of this could have been latter damage i think what we really need to do to get more information is to get some x-rays so you think that's the next I step i think that should be our next step this mummy did not suffer beheading that line of inquiry is closed. But Dr. McLeod's analysis has opened up another. The focus is now on the hole in the mummy's head. Could this be evidence of a fatal head wound? Harrogate Museum has a huge collection of Egyptian artifacts. Joanne and Duncan are searching the building's storeroom for a potential murder weapon. So basically, what we're looking for is something like a mace head. What exactly are mace heads? Are these a tool a, a, or a, a weapon? Or These are, are really pretty brutal things when you look at them. And although a lot of Egyptologists see them and assume they're probably ceremonial or ritual because they are relatively small, I think that they could be used as some sort of really serious weapon here because certainly in the art, what you find um, are scenes of the pharaoh smiting the enemy. They've got the bound prisoner on his knees in front of, of the pharaoh who's raising his hand with one of these in it and he's about to sort of bring down the, the fatal death blow um, using one of these. They are, I mean, they are very well um, made, aren't they? Beautifully finished. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite surprised at the, the different shapes and sizes oh, of them. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. These are wonderful ones as well. These are, if anything, even more brutal than the globular ones. You've got such a sharp edge on they, that. They'd cause a wound almost like a knife, wouldn't they? I mean, yeah. it's a very fine cutting edge almost. It's been finished beautifully. I'd love you to sort of scan one of these because they are absolutely amazing. Well, the works of art, really. But to think that they could have sort of killed someone it's something I'd love to find out. Well, and the good thing is that if we measure them, if we scan them and then start looking at the, the comparisons with the wound itself in the skull and start to identify maybe what sort of shape and what sort of dimension we're looking for, we need to get some of those upstairs and then start if recording we could, them. If we could sort of scan them all, that would be fantastic. Like the actual mummy, the ceremonial mace heads are thousands of years old and just as priceless. What we can do here is scan from above it, but also from underneath it, without uh, having to move the object at all. People have raised doubts. They have said these look too small to have done any damage. They must have been ceremonial. And, and we just want to answer that question one way or yeah, the other. We've been to a number of scenes of crimes where, where objects, you know, not much heavier than this and certainly not much bigger than this, have done awful injury to people. The scan will give the team an accurate digital image of the mace heads. Duncan will then be able to compare the data with the digital dimensions of the hole in the head that he took at the start of the investigation. It's just because they're 3,000 years old doesn't mean that we can't apply modern forensics and come up with good answers. We're adapting techniques that have only been um, adopted in the last two or three years to, to get answers for things that happened thousands of years ago. 
Despite having the latest in modern technology at their disposal, the mummy investigation team is so far no closer to unlocking the mystery of how the mummy died. Duncan is trying to digitally recreate how this man might have been killed, and Joanne is planning to physically reproduce the same kind of brutal injury. She wants to see exactly the kind of damage a real mace can do to a real skull. She's commissioned stonemasons to reconstruct a pair of ancient Egyptian mace heads. They're working the granite with diamond-tipped blades to ensure an accurate finish. And Joanne is on hand to ensure the modern techniques match the high standards of Egyptian craftsmanship. Do you think this looks right? I think it does. I think it's coming on really nicely. You like to take the chamfer a bit further down? Yeah, just just like a, a millimetre, a couple of millimetres maximum, just to get that just... nice curve coming along. Ancient Egyptians wouldn't have had the luxury of power tools to fashion their maces. They would have had to rely on flint to shape the granite and then the coarse texture of sand to smooth it. And the entire process would have taken weeks, not hours. So there we are. Just needs a final rub. It's a little bit bumpy. I mean, you can see already there I rubbed it a little bit with a diamond pattern. You can feel how smooth it gets. Oh, yeah, and that's pretty yeah. quick, isn't mm. it? This, does it feel like...? It feels it feels very, very tactile. It feels just like the ancient ones, because, it, in effect, that's just what you've, you've created. Just put a handle in and you'll wax somebody. Absolutely. Back at the incident room, Duncan is ready to examine his virtual reconstruction of a mace attack. What I've been putting together is the, is the raw laser scanning data of the mace heads. Um, and so we have the, the data from the mummy's head. And now with this, we have a digital resource that is the mace heads as well. And I've been looking to see whether any of them um, are potential um, cause of death, whether, whether the, the, the mace has been used to inflict the injury above the eye. I've ran through a number of hypotheses and then I've, I've animated the one that seems to suit best, and that is an attack from the front or from the side rather than from around the back. When we digitally put them back on that shaft, they come out to be the sort of dimension that you get right. with a claw hammer. You've got a, a strong wooden shaft and then a weighty and, in some cases, you know, quite pointed object that would cause a huge amount of damage. You know, I've seen the damage that, that uh, objects like that can do to people, yeah. and it's, it is definitely a potential cause of death. Um, you would definitely be able to inflict the sort of wounds that we're seeing above the eye. Right, so is there a particular one that you think is going to be more effective, or at least more likely to mm. be related to the injury that we're looking at? Certainly the ones that we looked at that were, were broadly in two, sort of two categories. There, was, uh, there were the ones with the ridge on, like you see here, and then there were the ones that were sort of more rounded and blunt. Um, both of equal weight, but I think that we're looking at the blunter one right, okay. for the size of the impact and also the sort of the more diffused um, shape to it. Joanne is going to attempt to match the damage on the mummy's skull to the replica weapon. If the skull damage matches, a mace could have been the murder weapon. Pig's heads have a similar skin and muscle structure to humans. Although the bone is thicker, a mace will do similar damage to either skull. The pig's heads will be struck by the two types of mace. Then they'll be x-rayed to see if the damage to the skulls matches images of the mummified head. Basically, these are the two very distinct types of mace heads the ancient Egyptians used. As you can see, they're very, very different in type. Yeah. So if, if I could give you those... Certainly. And then if I put on the heads themselves exactly where I'd like you to aim for to sort of replicate the kind of damage we saw on the mummy, that would be absolutely tremendous. So no take it away. Give it a go. Right. Okay. I think the second one's done the most damage, I think. Well, you've got a brilliant aim. So this, this one was inflicted with... With this one? With that one, that's yes. interesting. And then this one that I thought, personally, would inflict the most damage 
Hardly seems to have done anything, no, does it? No, no. That's intriguing. Contrary to their predictions, the disc mace has been the more lethal implement. With all the work that you've been doing, do you think that a blow from a mace head could have been the cause of death for our, for our individual? I have to say that, yes, it could. I have to say that nothing that I've looked at so far rules it out as a possibility. We need to maybe look at the, make, get some x-rays done, take this to, and you and Joe, maybe get some x-rays done, look at the type of wound that, that I can't see, so the damage yeah. that's inside the skull. Both forensic experiments have been a success. It looks as if the mummy could have been killed in a mace attack. The team now needs real proof to support the theory. The X-ray machine examines the damage. The focus is on the trauma beneath the surface of the skull that can't be seen by the naked eye. The X-ray images will give the team a closer look at the cranial damage to both pig's heads and the mummy to see if the wounds are consistent with each other. Professor Don Brothwell, a leading paleopathologist, will examine the X-rays. He's an expert in determining cause of death and was a leading investigator for the war crimes tribunals in the former Yugoslavia. Here we have the results of the X-rays back from the experiments we did on the pig heads with the maces. You can see this one is the uh, globe mace head, the circular one. And the effects on the other side of the disc mace head with the uh, nice fine edge. So very different injuries sustained on, on each of the pig skulls. And then we've got the actual skull, which also shows this area of damage. So I'd really like your opinions on the sort of comparisons we can see here in terms of the kind of injuries sustained. Well, I think as far as the pig skulls are concerned, the most damage is in the case of the left one there. There's far more damage I can see in that area, which is the top part of the snout, just where it begins to go into the sort of brain box area. Whereas there's little evidence of any damage on the other one. Professor Brothwell has identified extensive damage on the pig's heads. Bearing that in mind, the damage in the human skull is very modest and it follows the contour of a part of the frontal sinus system, the air spaces inside your frontal bone. Now, had it been a real serious impact injury, I would have expected damage to extend into the other parts of the frontal there. The damage to the mummy's skull just isn't extensive enough compared to the more dramatic trauma visible on the pig's skulls. After all the tests, a mace attack can be ruled out as the cause of death for this mummy. But there's still the mystery of how the injuries did happen. It's not an example of, of beheading. Oh, it's right. not a victim of uh, a mace attack. It, it wasn't sort of bludgeoned to death. So we need to try and establish exactly how such, you know, quite serious injuries were inflicted on this individual. To be sure that the team haven't missed anything, Joanne and Jill revisit the facts that they've already established about the mummy. We know that he's male. We know that he's high status, uh, both from the, the quality of the embalming, but certainly the results of the chemical analysis even show the, the nature of the hair styling fixative applied to his hair. So we know that in life he would have been quite a dandy, quite flash. He would have worn the, the, the wigs that they wore in those days, of course. Really marking him out in society, I think, as a high status yeah. individual. When we look at the possibility that this individual came from Saqqara, which is the burial place, of wealthy people. Yeah. It's going to be a prime place for tomb robbers to target. This person's going to have been buried in all of their finery, necklaces, jewellery, things like that. So tomb robbers are going to want to come in yeah. and rip out all of this stuff because Absolutely. they've got to be in and out as quickly as possible. 
what we've got here from the ancient times is somebody saying that we found this noble mummy of this king equipped like a warrior. A large number of sacred eye amulets and ornaments of gold was at his neck. It was a real smash and grab raid, exactly. wasn't it? Go in, head off, jewellery sure. chain. And, and, I mean, time was of the essence, wasn't it? So oh, yeah. they weren't going to well, hang I about. Mean, they would have had to have done it as quickly as possible to avoid being caught because, obviously, the punishment being caught was really severe. Yeah. You know, we know of examples of um, impalements, yeah. beatings and all sorts. So, you know, they really did have to be expert at getting into these tombs and getting out very quick. So, Well, that would explain both the... The, the beheading, so-called, and, and, and this, this blow, blow to the head. So both of which are post-mortem and both of which are certainly not the cause of death. Yeah. But even though tomb raiding might explain these injuries, the team is still no closer to establishing how the man actually died. Joanne is hoping that leading radiologist Dr Ian McLeod's detailed examination of the X-ray results may offer some much needed answers. What we've got is the top of the, the skull there, we've got the eye, and we're just seeing this sort of outline of the nose there. But what really intrigues me about this picture is what's happened to this gentleman's neck. Because here we've got the vertebrae at the top of the neck, and then this little piece here, which is what we call the odontoid peg, the bit that allows the head to rotate. Normally there should be a vertebrae sitting there, but in fact there isn't. It's sitting here. So it's been pushed right back. If I can just put up a normal uh, picture for you. Uh, this is a, an older radiograph, but uh, hopefully we'll sort of show it. It's what it should look like. And here we've got the same sort of vertebrae oh, yeah. coming up. You can just see on the inside there, there's this odontoid peg, and there's the vertebrae where it should be, and you can see very clearly on here... It's really gone back, hasn't it's it? It's pushed it right back. Would this have been inflicted in life or shortly after death? And this is an injury that must have occurred before mummification. Once the mummification process had taken place, the skin would have been like leather, and what would have happened if you'd applied this sort of level of force as the thing would have just smashed? What kind of action could have could have displaced it like this? It must have been somehow the head was lifted up and back, almost lifted off, to sort of create that. It's it very, very unusual. So some, some kind of violent manipulation of, of the head off the neck. It's it almost would, as if the head being the skull's been lifted off the vertebrae. It certainly has in order to allow that vertebrae to be literally physically dislodged over the top of the, the vertebrae beneath it. That's really disturbing. This man must have met a very violent death. And what's interesting, of course, is now having known that, if we go back to the original photograph that you bring in, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Because I, I noted on this strange-looking uh, contortion of the neck, and, you know, with a sort of an eye of faith almost, you could imagine a ligature or something around a that area of, of the neck. Cord or, or rope or something of that nature, which has obviously been pulled at great force. It's contorted the neck, and presumably, because it's at the right site, created that injury. So what we're really saying here is it's quite possible that some sort of cord or ligature was applied around the throat mm. to strangle this individual and pull tight to create this really horrific injury. Well, that would certainly fit with what we're seeing here. With um, some force. Incredible force. terrible, terrible injury and what a horrific yeah. way to die. Awful. Absolutely awful. This has been one of the toughest assignments yet for the mummy investigation team. This kind of status of mummification, this standard, isn't given to just anyone. But what we also have is beeswax. Would he have been so well marked out in society mm -hmm. to have him, you know, made himself a target? You could imagine a ligature which has obviously been pulled at great force but with limited evidence and no body to go on. The team has managed to figure out when this man lived, where he came from, his social standing, and they know that he was horrifically strangled to death. Strangulation was not a common method of state execution in Egypt and would be very unlikely in battle so the mummy investigation team can conclude the mystery man was almost certainly the victim of a brutal murder. 
what I found quite emotional and, and, and almost humbling was how quickly he became not an object to be measured and looked at, but became a person that you're trying to unravel. I think the science has really helped to put this, this individual into some sort of context. Even if we'd had the complete body, we wouldn't have had any more results. We couldn't have said more than, you know, who he was, where he was from, what the cause of death was. Is it the kind of random attack, you know, somebody crowding in on this guy to sort of steal the wealth that he must yeah. have displayed yeah. in life? Yeah.